Okay, now let me, uh, I actually would like to spend as much time as I can on, uh, on Durkheim's methodology. I have uh, lots of notes. Um, uh, this is the 24th lecture note uh, uh, this semester for this course. But let, let me rush through of the uh, test questions and just to tell you how I would like to uh, deal with them. I think the first one is, uh, you know, very obvious, probably a bit too obvious. Uh, uh, the question is, how can you make it interesting? Uh, I hope that the distinction between power and domination is clear, right? Power means that somebody can impose its will on somebody else, even if that other person opposes it. Uh, there is a, a strong element of coercion involved, right? Uh, you can coerce people to obey your command. Domination implies that you do not have to use coercion systematically um, uh, because people tend to internalize uh, the reasons those who have power um, use in order to legitimate why they should have power, right? And then this brings us to the notion of legitimacy, right? Legitimacy are the claims which are made by those who have power, which try to justify why it is reasonable that they should issue commands and others should obey it. Uh, so far, very simple, right? Uh, what is kind of controversial about this? Uh, it's controversial the way how Weber uses the notion of legitimacy. Normally, we, uh, in modern democratic theory, we believe that right, the system is legitimate um, when uh, um, it is, uh, has a popular consent. We think about universal suffrage. People go to free and fra fair elections, and then they elect leaders, and then they follow those, you know, those elected to office this way. Then power is legitimate. But I think Weber wants to have a broader notion of legitimacy because uh, free and fair elections operating with universal suffrage go back 100 years in human history and in some countries it still does not exist. And Weber does not want to describe the last 10 minutes of human history for human history is 24 hours, right? He wants to offer some conceptual tools to understand the whole 24 hours. So that's why he has this interesting notion of legitimacy, which it does imply that people have to have a certain degree of belief uh, in uh, the validity of the legitimacy claims. But it is a rather passive notion uh, of belief. They don't have to love the person in position of authority. They do not have to elect it. Um, they simply, it's enough if they think, well, um, I cannot think of a better alternative, right? Uh, another dictator could be worse than this one, <laughs> right? This is a dictator, but a reasonable one. And Weber will say, as long as this is happening, the person in authority will not have to use coercion systematically and therefore it will be legitimate, right? Let me also just say that, of course, the coercive element is also in domination, right? Um, uh, if people disobey uh, uh, the law, then they will be coerced. Um, there is certainly a promise of coercion um, uh, in, uh, even in modern free democracies. People are put in jail in this country, people are even executed. Right? So there is an element of coercion. Just the real question is how systematic that coercion should be. And for Weber, um, pure exercise of authority is relatively rare and marginal. Um, uh, uh, I would say, for instance, uh, uh, the sort of last year or two or three of, uh, of Hitler was clearly illegitimate. Hitler had to use massive coercion. Um, certain epochs of rule of uh, Stalin in the Soviet Union were illegitimate, not 
all the rule of Stalin. During the <coughs> Second World War, he established some legitimacy. But when he had to imprison 10 million people, right, and to kill tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands, that is an indication that this is illegitimate, okay? So that's the way how I would handle it, right? Uh, to work around uh, this interesting conception of legitimacy and uh, what is for and against this. Well, this is again a very simple question, traditional and legal rational authority, right? Uh, 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 the basic difference is, right, the traditional authority, you have a personal master. In legal rational authority, you do not have a personal master. You obey uh, the laws and the first people who are in charge, who are superiors, will also have to obey the same laws, what you are required to do. And traditional authority is legitimated by the sanctity of age-old rules. Here again, I think the interesting issue, if I would write about this, will be, well, this is a big you know, historical distinction. Um, but Weber also uses it to describe, in contemporary society, different type of organizations. So, contemporary theory has a big dose of traditional authority in it, right? Um, and I would try to elaborate on this. Well, um, this is, a, a, right, one of the trickier questions. Uh, why does Weber believe that bureaucracy is efficient? Um, uh, and you may agree or may, may disagree with him. Uh, so first of all, I would state why Weber believes that bureaucracy is efficient. I would emphasize that he thinks that bureaucracy is the most efficient in the technical terms, uh, not necessarily otherwise. Uh, and then, of course, the way how he defines bureaucracy, you know, people are put into position in terms of their competence. Um, there, there is a rule of law. It is a predictable environment, uh, a bureaucratic environment. There is a, 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 a hierarchy of appeals. If somebody makes a mistake, you know how to appeal. This, of course, all makes it um, uh, efficient. Now, we know that bureaucracies are often inefficient. So how to reconcile this? Now, that's not that Weber was totally insensitive to uh, the problem of inefficiencies of bureaucracies. And he formulated it how that bureaucracies are caught between formal and substantive rationality. That's the way how I would probably defend Weber to say he was not that naive to believe that bureaucracies are always efficient. They would be efficient if they will be purely, would be purely formally rational, but they are not. Um, and one good example is welfare bureaucracies, which do establish a kind of patron-client relationships, right, between um, uh, bureaucracies and clients. Some people refer to this as welfare dependency, which makes it, of course, a cause of inefficiency. Well, this is a, a you know, Nice question to answer. Um, uh, we discussed this a great deal. Um, uh, we know that charismatic leaders appear in times uh, uh, of uh, crisis when people are looking for a change, right? So uh, Barack Obama, during the presidential campaign, he has read Weber carefully. He knew how to frame right, his message exactly as a charismatic me message. It was all about change, and it was about hope, um, right? In contrast with Hillary Clinton um, or John McCain, uh, both of them emphasized that we are experienced. Uh, this is not what people wanted to hear uh, when they wanted to have change. Uh, so yes, in this respect, uh, 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 Barack Obama did have a charismatic appeal, and this charismatic appeal did um, uh, um, uh, gel, right? People, many people responded to his charisma. He was criticized by his opponent. 
that he's a rock star, right? Because people got so excited about him. So he could appeal to the emotion of people, right? He could uh, appeal to them. But of course, um, as we again discussed in discussion sections, also briefly in class, Barack Obama has a charismatic appeal, but he operates in a legal rational authority. Right? And we just have seen that very recently, right? Making a decision about the war on Afghanistan, right? Well, uh, he had to deal with realities, right? Um, uh, uh, so, well, Weber would, would uh, you know, in the classical sense, charisma in Weber is reserved to great religious leaders, such as Muhammad or Jesus or whatever, or the great prophets. Um, and in this sense, uh, charisma is not really applicable to politicians operating in legal rational authority. So Weber would have some unease to call uh, Barack Obama a charismatic leader. I would think he would concede that certainly Barack Obama had charismatic features uh, as such. Now the fifth question, um, Durkheim and the study of law. Why on earth he starts from the study of law um, in analyzing uh, society? Um, because he is a methodological collectivist and because he wants to capture something like the collective conscience, which is more than the sum total of individual consciousness. But he's also a scientist, and it, I hope I will have a little time to talk about the methodology. He wants to be very rigorous and he doesn't want to start with ideas, he wants to start with facts. Well, he is caught in uh, right a contradiction. So collective conscience is ideas. Well, how on earth you study them objectively? Uh, you see, and you know, law is a great example because law is written down, right? That is written law. You can study it objectively, and it is not on individual consciousness, but guides us all. So I think this is the major reason why he is, his point of departure is, as an example, law, because this is what he can rigorously study, can be seen as a social fact, right? That this is the law, and to understand why this law came into being under what circumstances and how does it influence people. Um, well, of course, the inspiration comes from Montesquieu. All right. Uh, well. Agreement and disagreement, uh, I think the real question is whether you buy into methodological collectivism or not. Uh, some of you may be methodological individualist, um, uh, especially if you are an econ major, you tend to be an economic individualist, uh, a, a methodological individualist, right? You tend to believe that, you know, there are rational individual actors who pursue interest, and you are very skeptical about anything which is uh, assumedly above uh, uh, the individual. So in that case, if you are a methodological individualist, and in fact, I think the dominant trend in social sciences today is methodological individualism and a great deal of skepticism about methodological collectivism that can be a kind of critical uh, uh, handle on it, uh, or at least you can show this is the way how it can be criticized and you can show why you actually think that methodological collectivism is reasonable. Okay, the sixth question, organic and mechanical solidarity and how this is related to Weber's typology of authority. I mean, it's, uh, you know, pretty s simple. Uh, um, uh, uh, there are ve very, very important distinction, uh, differences between Durkheim and Weber. Durkheim looks at what brings society together. The central concept is uh, um, uh, solidarity. Uh, Weber looks at social conflict, what takes society apart. So he looks at uh, um, uh, struggle around power, right? Um, uh, uh, Weber is coming from the lineage of, I would say, Hobbes and Nietzsche, right? That's um, where the Weberian view um, comes from. Uh, there is, are, are of course, similarities. Uh, 
mechanic, uh, organic solidarity is what legal rational authority is for Weber. They try to capture modernity. Uh, both are similar in the sense that they are also social typologies of societies, but also types of social organizations uh, in any given society um, as such. So these are uh, some similarities. Uh, uh, okay, I think that's probably about it. Well, the uh, question of anomie, uh, uh, I think we uh, covered this recently, so I don't have to refresh your memory as much. Uh, the notion of anomie um, uh, in Durkheim comes out of the absence of uh, uh, sufficient regulation. And this is a temporary product uh, which emerges because uh, um, uh, uh, mechanical solidarity is breaking down and organic solidarity has not been established yet. And in the transition from mechanical solidarity, traditional society, into a modern urban industrial society, people have a problem of regulation and value systems, and that's when they are anomic. But this will go away. Uh, what is the theory of human nature behind this? This can be debated. Um, uh, one possible argument is that since he believes that, you know, um, uh, order has to come from the outside, from above, uh, he tends to believe that without uh, uh, order um, created by a societal level, collective conscience, um, we would uh, uh, do evil things. <laughs> Um, we, we need to be regulated, right? Uh, uh, well, he, of course, he knows that we can be over-regulated, and then we, we can, that's also pathological. But the main pathology, at least in the transition from um, uh, uh, mechanical to organic solidarity, is the absence of regulation and the problem that, you know, humans may do uh, uh, um, abnormal uh, pathological uh, or evil acts. So that is a uh, um, uh, uh, notion of uh, uh, um, uh, humans be needing uh, uh, control over them. Now this is uh, uh, speaks to the AIDS question, anomie and alienation. Uh, they are in many ways the opposite to each other, right? Alienation means that you are overregulated. You do not. You are not. Uh, in control of your own life, of your own fate. Um, uh, that is what uh, alienation means. Um, also, Marx uh, uh, is inspired by Rousseau. Uh, it's a kind of Rousseauian conception of nature behind that. Uh, the problem comes from society, it doesn't come from the individual, right? Um, uh, we are born in society, we are social uh, by nature, um, and uh, if uh, uh, modernity, modern capitalism would, would be removed, we again would act socially and collectively in a good way. So that's, uh, uh, and in contrast, like Durkheim's notion is uh, the uh, absence of regulation, that's what causes pathologies. Uh, all right, ninth question. Uh, this is uh, something uh, what uh, uh, I think you find dif difficulties to deal with because you did not find the word disenchantment in any of the readings. And indeed, Weber did not use the word very often. He did use it uh, most critically in a, an essay, what he wrote after he was trying to combine his various sociology of religions. But um, the word enchantment, uh, uh, is translated from the German word magic. Um, so disenchantment means uh, a situation in which the word become, loses, loses magic, uh, when magic is moved out of life. And this is happening with rationalization, right? The big process of historical evolution is towards rationalization and the loss of magic. And the text, what you have to support that is in the Protestant ethic, where Weber makes a big deal out of it. That what, uh, especially Calvinism and the teaching of predestination did, it got rid of magic, right? But 
though he is, in a say, a rationalist, uh, he sees the downside of rationalism. The loss of magic is the price what we have to pay for rationalization. Uh, and he's a bit nostalgic about the world when it was magic, when the relations were magical. Um, uh, so uh, 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 that is uh, a, a kind of a permanent conditions of modernity. Things are not getting any better. That's, I think, one of the big, big differences uh, with uh, uh, Durkheim's notion of anomie. Um, uh, the loss of magic actually uh, uh, does mean, uh, like, you know, there is a Marx, you know, roots in Marx here. Because the loss of magic means that actually you, you seem to be more, more vulnerable to fate, right? Magic, were, you know, you were a magician, you had ways how to make God, the omnipotent God, to do things for you, for instance, um, uh, to save you, right? Um, uh, you could do it through magical means. In a rationalized world, we are uh, less in control of our lives. So, in this sense, I think Weber's notion of disenchantment is closer to the Marxian notion of alienation rather than the Durkheimian notion of anomie. Well, social causes of suicide. Uh, uh, well, we just covered this uh, 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 last lecture. Uh, uh, the argument is, right, that uh, we believe that suicide is the most individual, intimate decision he actually does show and demonstrate this is not the case because there are great differences um, uh, in suicide rate across countries. These differences tend to be very stable. There are also strong relationships between suicide and religion and suicide and education. And therefore, there are right, social determinants of this very individualistic action um, as, 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 as suicide. Well, there are these two dimensions in which you can conceptualize suicide, how well integrated you are, um, or how well regulated you are. And Durkheim has this idea that too much integration and too much regulation, or too little integration or too little regulation, are both abnormal. He is for the golden middle road, right? Um, uh, um, Normality is in, in the middle road. Uh, sort of an anomic su uh, suicide happens uh, um, when you are not sufficiently regulated. Um, egoistic suicide occurs when you are not sufficiently integrated uh, in society. That's when you are act egoistically commit suicide because you don't care how you yourself killing yourself will affect your beloved ones. <laughs> because you don't have beloved ones, right? You are not integrated in society, right? Uh, you do not commit egoistic suicide when you care about the beloved ones and you don't want to cause them pain by killing yourself, right? Um, anomic suicide happens if people are kind of uh, uh, not sufficiently regulated and therefore uh, uh, they, uh, uh, in this anomic uh, situation, make may commit suicide. Okay, so that's about it. And let me then move on to uh, Durkheim's methodology. Yeah, number 24. So this is the Rules of Sociological Method, published in 1895, uh, uh, two years after the division of labor and two years before the suicide, but uh, foreshadows and combines elements from both. I have a lot of stuff, so I will rush you through. One question is what he deals with uh, uh, 
When is a fact social? When can we talk about social facts? Then he asks how can we observe social facts? Then he makes a distinction between normal and pathological states. Um, uh, he also writes about nominalism and realism and offers an alternative to nominalism and realism. What is his system of classifications? And then he addresses the issue of the question of uh, explanation and causality, very path-breaking ideas uh, in his times. Um, so when is a fact social? Uh, and the first point is, well, we have to make a distinction between social and uh, uh, biological or psychological phenomena. Uh, well, uh, uh, and he, then he also, I will elaborate on this. Um, and then he uh, asked the question, how objective are the social facts? The biological facts are obviously objective, psychological, not so obviously, the social, the least so. How, why are they still objective? And then he labors on what makes the uh, social facts collective as such. And that is, of course, education is the major mechanism. Okay, so let, let's uh, ask the question, you know, what is the social fact as distinct from biological or psychological? Well, he said, well, if all facts what affect human beings uh, would be uh, 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 regarded as social, there would be no real discipline what he uh, should be called sociology. And as I pointed out before, right, he is the first person who identifies emphatically with the discipline of sociology. Uh, he actually has this notion of life sciences, uh, interestingly, right? And sociology is part of life sciences, right? There are three life sciences sociology, uh, biology, and psychology. But these three different life sciences deal with different uh, um, units of analysis, deal with different objects. All right? uh, biology deals with the body, uh, uh, psychology needs with a personality, uh, while sociology needs, this is his uh, shtick, right? uh, it deals with uh, collective representations, uh, right? He tries to move beyond the idea of collective consciousness, collective representation which somehow objectively um, embodies uh, as a fact uh, uh, the states of collective consciousness. Um, and therefore he said, this is indeed a set of phenomena I will be able to uh, uh, distinguish with other uh, um, facts. So when, when do I act socially? He has a question. I do so uh, when I execute uh, my contract, right? I perform duties, right? Uh, which are defined externally to me, right? Uh, if I perform my duties, then I am acting socially. I'm a socially responsible person. That seems to be right? straightforward and obvious. Okay, how, ob how objective they are. That's that in, at first look, it doesn't look too objective because the sense of obligation seems to be very subjective, right? Uh, you may occasionally say uh, to your partner, you are irresponsible, right? By which you mean, you know, you don't have enough of a feeling of a duty towards me, right? Um, so that is a... a this subjective element uh, involved in this. But he said, nevertheless, uh, we can see this is still objective. Um, um, and one of the major way how we can understand it is objective, um, that um, uh, uh, in fact uh, um, uh, there is some external enforcement right, of these uh, obligations. If you keep breaking these obligations, there will be penalties against you. Right? Well, not all the time. Occasionally you can get away with it, but at one point uh, there may be punishment. You see others being punished by not 
uh, fulfilling their duties or obligations. Uh, and therefore, uh, uh, it, you can see that that is externally enforced. It's not just subjective thing that you, have, you think you have duties, right? It will be externally um, uh, Im implemented. So, well, you have obligations, right? That's 7 p.m. today to go uh, on the internet and <laughs> unload questions, right? And uh, to answer two of them. Uh, well, uh, uh, this of course will come as a subjective feelings of uh, duty in you. It's uh, have enough guilt feelings if you don't do it in a timely manner, if you would be late. Uh, uh, it's sufficiently internalized in you. Uh, but, uh, you know, you know that there were occasions when people were late with an assignments and there were you know, teaching just, uh, fellows or professors who deducted, right, something from the grade. So, therefore, you don't want to risk a lower grade and beyond, you know, your deep personal commitment that I want to fulfill my duty in a timely manner, right? There is also a, a concern that if I don't, I may get some penalty, right? So, that's what it makes it social, right? Okay. Uh, so, um, well, it has to be collective, right? Uh, it cannot be just individual. Uh, we have, a, you know, uh, we have a collective sense of uh, uh, ob obligations, uh, um, and he uses the term habits. Uh, it's a very good term, uh, uh, which uh, um, I don't think has been used before him so forcefully as Durkheim. It became very um, widely used uh, um, more recently following another great French sociologist, Pierre Bourdieu, who turned this term habit into a term habitus, right? Well, habit, habitus, mores, uh, manners, uh, uh, ways of life, right, means that we have a uh, uh, as something, uh, um, uh, 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 we, we know how to navigate in social life, right? We know how to deal with situations. These are habits, the ways how we behave in social life. And he said, where does it come from? He said, this is coming from education, right? It's, uh, uh, you are being educated, you know, what you are supposed to do. Um, well, uh, that's not exactly, right, what Hobbes meant. Hobbes had this idea, right, of manners and customs, but he believed that these manners and customs simply he could explain from the individuals, act, in, individual actors, right? The individuals act, and then they know that there will be another, an alter who will respond. Uh, they evaluate what the possible answer of the alter will be, and therefore they will learn ways how to navigate anticipating possible punishment from alters, right? So he, uh, Hobbes can do it uh, uh, by uh, doing a methodological individualist exercise. Durkheim exercises, no, I mean this is not how we learn it, uh, through acting and getting punishment and seeing others being punished. It is through the system of education. Now, this is a good, good point, an interesting point. Um, well, uh, and here again, right, uh, this is kind of crystallized in ways of acting. That's what habit, or uh, in the more contemporary version, habitus, uh, is, is all about, right? I think a Bourdieu also means that habitus is something what you learned and carry in yourself. Uh, and uh, uh, depending what your habits or habitus are, uh, will mean how you will fit in different situations. Um, uh, we, we, we occasionally think that people get into a positions where they don't have the appropriate habitus to behave, right? They have, and therefore they may not be performing a task very well because they do not have the proper habits. The habits are kind of internalized earlier in life and then it helps us to perform different functions in society. Well, I have to rush. So how do we observe social facts? 
And now here comes social, these social facts are things. Uh, and what we need is a rigorous discipline, right, uh, for social analysis. And that also implies that we have to get rid of all of our preconceptions. We have to define the objects of our investigations independently from our values. Uh, it's almost a value-free science, what he argues, I will say not quite. And we have to get rid of those data which are too subjective, sort of. Social facts are things, objects. Well, this is a very interesting citation, what you would not expect from Durkheim to come. And reads almost like Karl Marx in the German ideology, right? The proper science should not proceed from ideas to things, but from things to, to ideas, right? It reads almost identical to the German ideology. But he, of course, means something different, right? The things are not property relations, right? The things are actually collective manifestations, right? Collective ideas. Uh, so uh, the notion of thing is used here a very, in a very unique and very different way. But what he emphasizes, right, that they are not the individual ideas, but they are kind of crystallized. Uh, and it's out there over us. Uh, like things, uh, what we cannot change, uh, individuals cannot really change. Um, and he said, well, social sciences uh, ev evolve just like natural sciences uh, by getting rid of uh, prejudices, right? Um, uh, uh, dogmas, to moving beyond dogmas and uh, uh, substitute them with the study of facts. That's what Bacon, the philosopher, right, in 17th century suggested. All scientific investigation should start uh, from induction, from the observance of uh, sensually observable facts. So he invokes Bacon, right, that this is the scientific method, right? Uh, um, well, it, it is not necessarily sensuousness uh, which is emphasized in uh, in, in Durkheim, but uh, moving beyond preconceptions and dogmas. And he said, well, the theory should be only, only introduced when science is sufficiently at an advanced stage. Well, this is a very good uh, advice to people who are graduate students and are doing dissertations. Don't start with theory, right? Start by analyzing social facts and when you at sufficiently advanced, that's when you find the proper theory. When you will be doing your senior thesis, I think it's a good advice to take, right? Don't start to, with, with big words, start with, uh, with actual um, analysis and find um, theory when uh, um, uh, you already um, uh, have a, a scientific idea. And here he comes, uh, uh, a strong critique of economists of his time, a critique what some people will say would apply to economists today. He said economists uh, today principally are occupied how the economy ought to work rather than to understanding how the economy actually works. Right? Uh, Paul Krugman just published a little piece in New York Times a couple of weeks ago uh, he actually accused his own colleagues. He said, you created this mess, you know, with the financial markets because you were never looking at how the economy really works. You operated how the economy should be working, but we really should be studying how the economy works. So it's an interesting criticism of economics. What, I mean, not necessarily um, uh, true for all economists, and it's it can be debated whether a normative science which describes how something should operate is illegitimate. But he certainly takes the idea that it should not be a normative. Well, we have to get rid of preconceptions, right? And he said Descartes and Bacon disagreed with each other, right? As I said, Bacon was the one who said the analysis should start from um, um, uh, induction observing uh, f f f 
phenomena that we can sensuously study and then move towards theorizing later on. Descartes uh, uh, was opting for a deductive method. He said, well, we have to start from general abstractions and then to move to uh, derived hypothesis from this general and then to move to the facts. This, uh, this is the difference between Bacon and Descartes. But he said, but they do agree in one thing, namely that no matter whether you, your reasoning is inductive, right, from observation to theory, or deductive from theory to observation, they agree that we should get rid of the dogmas, um, and no preconceptions. And he said this is particularly difficult in social sciences because we think we know how society works. We, we don't necessarily think we need social scientists to tell us how society works. We experience society and therefore we have an idea how it works. And we have strong interest how we would want society to work. And if uh, the conception, uh, if the findings goes against our interest or beliefs, strong sentiments, we tend to disregard it. So it's very difficult to get rid of dogmas in social sciences because we have an ordinary knowledge, right? Not scientific, but ordinary knowledge how society and the economy operates, right? And we have an interest as, as well involved. So very difficult to get rid of our preconceptions. Well, he said, well, yes, because we have very strong sentiments. And that's okay. Uh, we should study the sentiments. The st sentiments should study as, as if they were objects. We, but we should not be led by sentiments, right? Uh, 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 we have to proceed uh, uh, without uh, uh, passion and without uh, 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 prejudices. Well, we have to define the objects of our investigation independently from our, our values as such. Um, uh, um, and therefore, he said, we have to come up with objective definitions of what we are studying. He said, what is a crime? He said, crime is a social act which, which are punished. Uh, Therefore, I don't have to make a value judgment in defining crime if I see a society in which certain acts are systematically punished by that society. I can say in this society this is defined as a crime. I may disagree with this. I may say this should not be a crime, but in this society it is a crime. In many societies, for instance, uh, homosexual acts were defined as a crime. In those societies, they were a crime. You can disagree with it, and you should say, well, homosexuality should be decriminalized, as it was fortunately decriminalized. It's not a crime any longer. Uh, well, smoking and selling marijuana is a crime, right? It is being punished. You can end up in jail. That's a fact. You may think that marijuana should be decriminalized, but the fact that the, the consumption of marijuana and marketing of marijuana is a crime today in the United States is an objective fact, right? And it can be studied by looking at the law and what on earth judges do in this country, right? Uh, so that's uh, um, his, his point. It, it, it doesn't matter what your values are, what matters what the practices of society are. The same goes for morality. He said, well, some people will say, well, they are immoral because they are differently than I do. He said, no, every society has morality. You have to understand what their morality is, even if it is a different from your own morality. Well, we have to disregard two subjective uh, 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 informations. Uh, uh, this is what scientists do when they use measures and instruments. Uh, that's what, you know, he's very much attracted to uh, the scientific reasoning in, in sociology. It's a very French idea. Then, and then he makes a distinction between normal and pathological. So what is the difference between normal and pathological? Well, he said normal is the most frequent form of action, right? Uh, uh, we need a conception for normality because we just cannot operate without defining uh, 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 
normality. But how can we do that and at the same time remain objective when we can say something is abnormal without us making it? He said it's easy because what we shall do, that we should regard those as normal, uh, which is sort of uh, the most uh, uh, common way of act, and to define the extremes uh, as uh, abnormal. And he said the reason for this is that it would be incomprehensible uh, if the most widespread act uh, would not at the same time the most advantageous one. But then he takes it back, he said, well, we can actually see a number of occasions when frequently uh, 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 behavior which is frequently followed is actually not useful. Uh, in this case, we it, it may be inherent, inherited from the past. It may have been functional at one point of time. Uh, the situation changed and people still keep their habit and they still keep behaving that way and that can be now defined as abnormal, though it can be probably quite average behavior, right? Uh, think of racism, for instance, is a good example, right? Uh, 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 well, that is a very interesting argument about crime. He said, well, a crime looks like it is indeed by definition pathological, but is it? He said, well, crime is present in all societies. Uh, so uh, when is, uh, 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 <laughs> he makes this very interesting argument, and therefore really I think we are calling crime abnormal if there are too much crime in society. Crime per se is a normal state uh, uh, as such. Well, I think I leave this nominalism, realism argument out. Uh, 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 We'll put it on the internet. Uh, about causality, I finish with the idea of causality. He said, well, the task of social sciences is to explain, not only to describe, to be able to deal with the causes and causality. And there are different methods how to do causality. He said, in social sciences, the typical method is comparative. Uh, rather than experimental. In natural sciences, we do experiments. In social sciences, we can't. Experiment does assume that we assign a certain stimuli um, randomly to a population and then to see how they respond to the stimulus. We can't do that in society. And I'm, as I mentioned about uh, uh, suicide, we cannot uh, uh, assign people to get married and others to assign not to get married and to study later on what the effect of marriage was on something like suicide. So therefore what we can do is it the comparative method. Well, uh, I think I'm out of time. He makes a distinction between two types of comparative methods. Uh, the comparative methods uh, 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 can be uh, um, uh, either the method of agreement, a method of agreement if I compare two similar type of societies, for instance the United States and Canada, and to see whether there is difference between these two countries. Uh, for instance, uh, the level, I have a theory that uh, poverty may be related to crime. People in, you know, who, who are hungry are more, more likely to steal food, right, because they have to f feed themselves, to put it very simply. Now I compare two societies by the level of property, uh, poverty is the same, and then I will see whether you know, it is indeed uh, 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 poorer people are more likely to commit certain type of crimes. Or I can do the method of difference, and the method of difference if I compare two very different countries. I compare the United States with Bangladesh, where there is a very different rate of crime, right? And then I see whether there is a difference uh, um, in, um, in, in crime as such. He said the problem with this method is um, uh, that there is uh, not enough cases and therefore the proper method, interestingly argues, is correlation. What we have to do is to find what the correlation are between two variables. Well, this was guiding contemporary social sciences, but um, Durkheim was smarter than uh, most number crunchers in social sciences because here, here I think the last sentence what I show you is important. 
Well, you have to make sure that uh, the relationship, what the causal relationship shows, is really causal, right? And therefore, we shall investigate by the aid of deduction how one of the two terms has produced the other one, right? Uh, today, we would say uh, what uh, Durkheim is suggesting, if you want to establish real causality, short of the possibility of an experimental uh, method, you have to figure out what is the causal mechanism, what relates the two phenomena together, which are statistically correlated to each other. Statistical correlation does not necessarily show that they are one is causing the other one, right? Uh, there are, uh, uh, that, you know, you have a theory that the storch uh, brings the baby, and then you test this, and you show that, you know, fertility in Scandinavia is low, and there are not many storches. So you have a very strong correlation between number of storches and number of babies being born. This still does not show that, right, the storches bring the babies, right? Therefore, you have to look at the causal mechanism, how babies are being produced. That's basically, I think, a very early insightful argument by Durkheim's methodology. And that's about it. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thanks. They do not have to elect it. Um, they simply, it's enough if they think, well, um, I cannot think of a better alternative, right? Uh, another dictator could be worse than this one, right? This is a dictator, but a reasonable one. And Weber will say, as long as this is happening, the person in authority will not have to use coercion systematically, and therefore it will be legitimate, right? Let me also just say that, of course, the coercive element is also in domination, right? Um, uh, if people disobey uh, uh, the law, then they will be coerced. Um, there is certainly a promise of coercion, um, uh, in, uh, even in modern free democracies. People are put in jail. In this country, people are even executed. Right? So there is an element of coercion. Just the real question is how systematic that coercion should be. There are elections, and then they elect leaders, and then they follow those, you know, those elected to office this way. Then power is legitimate. But I think Weber wants to have a broader notion of legitimacy because uh, free and fair elections operating with universal suffrage go back 100 years in human history, and in some countries it still does not exist. And Weber does not want to describe the last 10 minutes of human history for human history is 24 hours, right? He wants to offer some conceptual tools to understand the whole 24 hours. So that's why he has this interesting notion of legitimacy, which it does imply that people have to have a certain degree of belief uh, in uh, the validity of the legitimacy claims. But it is a rather passive notion uh, of belief. They don't have to love the person in position of OB. And for Weber, um, pure exercise of authority is relatively rare and marginal. Um, uh, uh, I would say, for instance, uh, uh, the sort of last year or two or three of, uh, of Hitler was clearly illegitimate. Hitler had to use massive coercion. Um, certain epochs of rule of uh, Stalin in the Soviet Union were illegitimate. Not all the rule of Stalin. During the <laughs> Second World War, he established some legitimacy. But when he had to imprison 10 million people, right, and to kill tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands, that is an indication that this is illegitimate, okay? So that's the way how I would handle it, right? Uh, to work around uh, this interesting conception of legitimacy and uh, what is for and against this. Well, this is again a very simple question, traditional and legal rationale. 
Okay, now let me, uh, I actually would like to spend as much time as I can on, uh, on Durkheim's methodology. I have a lots of notes. Um, uh, this is the 24th lecture note uh, uh, this semester for this course. But let, let me rush through of the uh, test questions and just to tell you how I would like to uh, deal with them. I think the first one is, uh, you know, very obvious, probably a bit too obvious. Uh, uh, the question is, how can you make it interesting? Uh, I hope that the distinction between power and domination is clear, right? Power means that somebody can impose its will on somebody else, even if that other person opposes it. Uh, there is a, a strong element of coercion involved, right? Uh, you can coerce people to obey your command. Domination implies that you do not have to use coercion systematically um, uh, because people tend to internalize uh, the reasons those who have power um, use in order to legitimate why they should have power, right? And then this brings us to the notion of legitimacy, right? Legitimacy are the claims which are made by those who have power, which try to justify why it is reasonable that they should issue commands and others should obey it. Uh, so far, very simple, right? Uh, what is kind of controversial about this? Uh, it's controversial the way how Weber uses the notion of legitimacy. Normally, we, uh, in modern democratic theory, we believe right, the system is legitimate um, when uh, um, it is, uh, has a popular consent. We think about universal suffrage. People go to free and fra fair